Send your scariest workplace stories to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. And rate and review Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thanks. How do you protect a home when the intruder has been dead for a very long time? I can relate. I think I've been dead inside for 30 years now. Taking each day one espresso and fiber gummy at a time. What a combo. Hey, good to see you back, dear friends. I'm heading on my break right now. And boy, do I have some scary work stories for you today. Stories I've heard recently about a bizarre creature dragging an officer from his car, a bodyguard coming face to face with the unexplained, and more. Grab yourself a chocolate croissant, maybe even a nerd's rope. I freaking love those. These are tales from the break room. Alluring Silence from Chihiro It's been a long time since this happened, at least a few years, but I can finally say what happened without feeling absolutely and utterly insane. I've told this tale to friends, family, and even my therapist, and they say the same things. It's trauma, PTSD, maybe even a vivid hallucination. But I know what happened, and I know it was real and viable, right there in front of me. Breathing, staring me down, tearing me from that twisted clump of metal. I'm a sheriff for a local police force in Iowa, out in the middle of nowhere, USA. All I usually patrol are teenagers who've had a little too much to drink and went on a joyride, or the local drunk stumbling around the streets yelling incoherent gibberish at passersby. It's not a glorious job, but it keeps me fed and my family off the streets. Some days I'm grateful for the mundane. Others I wish something was going on, but most days I just enjoy the safety of normality. I was on my fourth cup of coffee for the night, tapping my pen on my notepad that I'd filled with hundreds of small doodles of various characters. This in and of itself was part of my normal night. Drink coffee, go on a few tours around town, come back and look over case files I'd seen dozens of times, and finally go home. Speaking of home, I looked at the clock, seeing I had another six hours on shift. So I decided to go for a tour around town, down all the dark alleys and the back roads, as I usually did at least twice a night. I found myself falling back into routine. I grabbed my keys, jumped into the car, and started the slow crawl down the back roads, which were nothing more than dirt and broken gravel. Our town never really cared to maintain these roads, as mostly rednecks, hunters, and very few wanderers tended to use them. So they laid to rot, forgotten amongst the woods that encircled our small town. That night was clear, which was a relief after the week of fog thick enough to see only a few inches in front of your face. I slowly maneuvered my way through the dirt roads, going slow because of how often deer are hit through here. Deer really aren't that smart. Seems like they stand there and play chicken with you. Anyway, I'd made it 10 miles out of town, and I was just about to turn back, when to my dismay, I found myself turned around. This didn't happen often. I was careful to stick to routes I knew, so I was quite confused as I turned my car to see an unfamiliar road ahead of me. I would have had to come from that way, so how could it possibly be different? I tried to radio dispatch. Holly was usually the one on the other line this late at night, and her low melodic voice would have done wonders for my nerves, but it seemed that my radio was not working. There was no noise when I clicked the button, nor any lights on the device. Needless to say, I was a little more than panicked at that moment, but I decided to try my luck and head down this road. That was a mistake. I found myself in the midst of a fog bank about a mile in. I don't know how that was possible. The weather had just been so clear, and the night air had been quite warm. But here I was, surrounded by dense fog that seemed to swallow everything it curled around. I was utterly shocked that such a thing had seemingly come from nowhere, and nothing looked familiar. But the only thing I could do 
was continue on and pray. I was almost scared to keep going, but a loud noise from behind me had me going as fast as I dared. It was very loud. It rang through my ears, sending chills down to the bone and made me instantly nauseous. I was scared, far from contact, alone, and worst of all, lost. I glanced in the mirror, and I saw a dark shape chasing after my squad car. The noise was a sort of horrible scream or yell, and it was getting closer until it was right ahead of me. I couldn't stop. My car slammed into it, which didn't even seem to phase whatever it was. I was out for a few moments, having hit my head pretty hard when the airbags went off, so I was dazed and disoriented. I woke when I heard the metal door being pried open. I'd hoped it was help after I slammed into what I thought was a deer. Instead of hands, though, long claws wound their way around me, yanking me from the car and tossing me onto the dirt road. The creature was tall, roughly nine feet, completely covered in matted dark fur with a color so dark I couldn't tell what it was, but I could see eyes piercing into my soul. I was terrified. I didn't know what I was looking at. I was confused and dizzy. I could tell my arm was fractured and that throw didn't do me any favors. Not to mention I'd been negligent that night. Expecting a normal patrol, I was not armed. I got up as quickly as I could and sprinted for my life. I didn't know where I was or even how far from town I was, but I could hear that thing lumbering after me, sounds like spitting and hissing and tearing up the dirt road. It was awful. The creature gave off a scent like corpses left in the sun for days with a hint of roadkill baked on the asphalt. And the sound it made was unnerving, a mix of a human trying to sound like a deer or an elk. It was somehow a scream and the growl of a bear at the same time too. And God, those eyes were dead and soulless and hungry. I ran and ran, no air left in my lungs. I was wheezing. As shameful as it is, I was crying from the fear and the pain. Before long, I stopped hearing the beast behind me, but at the same time, the world around me grew darker, fainter, and I found myself lying on the road to the entrance of town. One moment I was alone, the next, paramedics loomed over me. When I came to, I was informed I had wrapped my car around a light pole, and I had managed to drag myself out of the car before it ignited. I tried desperately to tell someone, anyone, what happened, but it was concluded to be hysteria or delusions from the concussion. I was put on a month-long leave and handed over to a therapist who would help me put the vivid delusions behind me. I faked getting better so I could go back on patrol, but I will repeat it here, I knew it was real. I knew what I saw, what I ran from, but the boss could see something in me was frightened. I got a nice comfy desk job before I was eventually let go months later, with a very nice severance at the least. What I experienced will haunt me for the rest of my days, but I had to tell someone, anyone who would understand. Stay away from the backwoods of Iowa. Room 127, from Rudy B. I worked as a CNA for five years at a nursing home in my small town. I, along with several coworkers, had multiple paranormal experiences here. But the one that I can honestly say none of us could ever explain happened my last year working there. It was August of 2021. COVID had settled down for the most part and most of our routines were going back to normal. I got put on the rehab hall, which was a hall they placed residents who either had surgery, for example, a knee replacement, and came to recover before returning home, or they were residents who were there to pass away. This particular day, I got a couple in a room. This wasn't uncommon, 
but I had never personally been over a married couple that shared a room. The husband had dementia and was going to be staying with us, and his wife had a knee replacement and needed to be with us until she was well enough to be discharged. They were a sweet couple and loved each other very much. Even with his dementia, her husband knew that his wife was supposed to be by his side. The couple, whom we will call the Smiths, were very pleasant to be around and to take care of. Pretty soon, the wife had told all the staff to call her Granny. I grew close to them as I had lost my grandmother in 2017, and having someone who couldn't really fill that role but be there for me was nice. One night, I was checking on all the residents during one of my walkthroughs. It was midnight, and I heard a soft crying. It was coming from 127, the Smith's room. I knocked softly on their door, which was cracked open a little. I called out to Mrs. Smith, who was usually up crocheting or reading late into the night. But when I got into the room, both of them were sound asleep. All I heard at the moment was the sound of the CPAP machine, which Mrs. Smith had to wear while sleeping. Having worked overtime this past week, I thought, hey, I'm hearing things and just need some rest. I walked out, cracking their door again and heading to the nurse to let her know I was going to take my break. Well, I was on my break, watching YouTube videos on my phone, when I heard it again. That soft cry. Now, sometimes there would be empty rooms in the hall, and being respectful to the housekeepers, I wouldn't touch anything in the room that had been cleaned. I would just sit in the recliner for my 15 minutes before getting back to work. Now, the empty room I was currently sitting in happened to be right across the hall from, you guessed it, room 127. I turned off my phone and listened for a good minute, and I heard the crying. Slowly, I stood up, walking to the door of the smith's room, which was still cracked from before. It was definitely coming from inside. Before I could even reach up to knock on the door, the door slowly creaked open, making a sound like you would hear in a horror film, until it was wide open and I was staring into the dark. I walked in again, saying, Hello, Mrs. Smith? Mr. Smith? Are you two okay? No answer. Same as before, they were both fast asleep. Starting to get a little freaked out, I reported back to the nurse and told her what I'd heard and what was going on. She looked at me with big eyes, telling me that about six years ago, there had been a couple in that room before. She was a CNA at the time, going through nursing school, and was in charge of taking care of the couple occupying that room. In her night shifts, she would hear crying and come to find out it was the wife of the man sent to the nursing home with stage 4 cancer. He was slowly but surely passing away, and she was a resident as well, who just wanted to be with her husband. She explained the husband passed away, and the wife about two months after passed away as well. The wife would cry every night to herself until she was finally able to reunite with her husband. She said, That's the first time we've had anyone hear her or mention it since then. It's been a while. I almost forgot about it, honestly. Okay, so why is she here now? Mr. Smith seemed fine today, and Mrs. Smith was smiling and crocheting potholders before bedtime earlier. Everyone seems fine, I replied. The nurse shrugged her shoulders, and we both brushed it off not hearing anything else the rest of the night. The following night, I came to work. I was greeted by a day shift employee who told me he kept hearing the same sounds as well and was now himself freaking out. He was staying over that night until 10 p.m. to make up some time off, so we worked the hall together. Then at about 9.30 p.m., we both heard it at the same time. The soft crying... He went into the room first, and we checked on the patients. This time, Mrs. Smith was still awake, reading. She smiled as we walked in. She greeted us and gave us each a potholder she'd made, and we talked to her for a good ten minutes 
before my coworker realized it was time for him to go home. So he went to finish his charting while I said goodnight to the residents and checked on the remainder of the hall. I came to the nurse's station just in time to see my coworker grabbing his bag, about to go clock out, when we heard a big crash. He threw his bag down and both of us took off down the hall. Lying on the floor next to his bed was Mr. Smith, and poor Mrs. Smith was trying to get him back up, just crying. Mr. Smith was trying to get out of bed and kept saying, That lady was standing over my bed crying again. Our eyes locked and we helped him back into bed, calling the nurse to check him out and calming Mrs. Smith down. That very night, Mr. Smith passed away in his sleep, and Mrs. Smith would follow not even two months after. Until my last day at the nursing home, I would hear those cries, and sometimes it would get me to the point of crying myself. Nobody knows why the crying lady is still in room 127, but on my last day working there, before accepting my new job, I sat in that room and told whoever was in there that I was sorry. I felt as if I had to say goodbye to them before I could move on myself. They turned that hall into a therapy hall, I guess you could call it, after I left, and part of me wonders if the lady is still there, or if she's now moved on after I told her goodbye. I do hope I gave her the closure she needed. Warning. The following story contains depictions of violence against pets. Shadows in the Snow From Forest Fox It was a cold winter night. I had just finished a double shift at the nursing home and was utterly exhausted. I walked out to my car clicking the key fob only to have no response from my vehicle. I swore under my breath, drawing my coat around me for warmth. It was at this time I really regretted buying an electric car. I stood there shivering before pulling out my cell phone, calling for assistance from my dearest friend, Seth. He was awake, obviously, as he was an insomniac, and while I usually nag him to sleep, I was grateful he was up at the time. Be there in 20. Let me grab my jacket and keys, he told me. I was so thankful, trembling from the cold. I walked back to the building into the reception area, where I watched snow beginning to fall. The temperatures were sure to drop below the 34 degrees they already were. I could hear the wind howling by the window, and it made me feel even colder. I saw headlights, so I began to gather my purse and go back outside. It was snowing pretty heavily by then. Seth! I stopped in the middle of the parking lot, seeing a blue Civic. This wasn't Seth. It was my coworker who hastily ran into the building almost late. I was heading back to the warmth when a loud bang filled my ears. The power went out, causing the building to go on lockdown. I started to panic. That meant I couldn't get back inside. I quickly called Seth again, and he quickly picked up. Kathy, there's been a wreck. I'm fine, but my car is totaled. I can't come get you. The cops are here. I've got to go. I'm sorry. With that, my way home officially died. I stared at the snow swirling around me, cursing the day I got that electric push-to-start car. It didn't even have any keyholes that I could just jam the key into, and I knew almost nothing about cars to fix it. With the building lock, I couldn't just run in for help. I fought back the incredibly strong urge to panic. I was cold, hungry, and utterly miserable. I picked up the phone, dialing coworkers, friends, and family, but they were either hours away or didn't answer. I was so upset that I started staring at the road, calculating how long it could take me to walk home. The tow trucks wouldn't come through the area with how bad it usually got when it snowed here. I was rather disappointed with my circumstances, but I had snagged my jacket and wrapped it tightly around me, slowly becoming less cold. But I noticed some odd movements in between the haze of snow. It was sudden, 
but I captured small glimpses of tiny darting black things in several colors. At first, I thought perhaps it was the snow messing with my eyes, or maybe I'd missed my anxiety medication. My eyes were wide, taking in the slightest movement and seeing so many small creatures in the snow. I was getting scared. My heart raced, blood chilling in the cold night air. I ran to the glass doors of the nursing home, banging on them frantically, sobbing to be let back in. I was horrified, not sure what to do. If I had to protect myself, what would I even reach for? I didn't even know what these things were. Was I hallucinating, having a sort of delusion from the cold? I didn't get an answer at the door. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw those creatures starting to swarm near me, and I shrieked, darting towards the road. I was nearly plowed into by a red Ford, which slammed on its brakes mere inches from me. The driver was a large, burly man with blue eyes and gray hair. What are you, crazy? Then he looked behind me. I think he saw them too. So maybe I wasn't crazy. Get in! He called. I didn't even second guess this man who I didn't know. I jumped into his truck, slammed the door behind me, and yelled, Go! He went speeding down the road as quickly as he dared. Look, little lady, I don't know who you are or what those were, but we can't be out here. Power's out all around town right now. I pulled up my phone, seeing no bars. God, can you just take me home, please? I live on Maple in Cyprus. He seemed surprised. What's your name? Kathy, please take me home. That's all I want to do, to get away from whatever that was. To go home, go to bed. Pleased to meet you, Kathy. I'll happily take you home. You actually live near my son, Seth. I was surprised. Seth? Uh, he's my best friend. He was actually just in a wreck. But on the phone, he said he was fine. The police will take him home. He nodded. He called me and let me know what was going on. I felt the fatigue creeping up, since I knew I was finally safe and warm. I never knew he had such a cool dad. Thank you for rescuing me. What's your name? Sam. He gave me a smile before gradually slowing to a stop, right before my house. I think I remember Seth saying his best friend lived here. Was I right? I nodded, quite happy to be home. Yes. Thank you so much. Feel free to stop by sometime. I'll get you some food. By the way, any idea what those things were? Sam frowned, the wrinkles around his forehead deepening. Not really sure, nor do I want to know. Just count your blessings that you're safely home. I gotta go check on Seth, but we'll visit another day. Good night, Kathy. I fumbled with my house key letting myself in and locking it firmly behind me. The electricity was out, much like Sam had said, so I used my phone's flashlight until I found the candles, which I then lit all around the living room and kitchen. My cat greeted me with a long meow, and I pet her for a while before getting her some food. I was exhausted, so I blew out most of the candles and lay on the couch, once I was satisfied, the house wasn't going to catch fire. It didn't take long for me to fall asleep. I was out for several hours. Despite feeling so exhausted, it felt like I only slept moments. I woke up to my cat, Luna, hissing at the stairs. I woke up in a panic, wondering what my sweet-mannered cat was hissing at. I didn't see anything at first. I went to use my phone's flashlight only to see the phone was dead. I mean, I couldn't really charge it with the power out. Nothing I could have done. I then began to hear scurrying around the shadows. This startled and scared me. There was a smell coming from the sound too. It was horrible. I was nauseous the second I caught a whiff of it. I couldn't see what was making the noise and the smell, 
but I could see the outline. It was darker than the night itself. I screamed, and Luna ran for the downstairs. I then saw something dart from the shadows running after her. All the while I shrieked in horror, racing to follow the two. But a smell stopped me. A coppery smell, thick and awful. I knew what this was, and I hoped I was wrong. When I got to Luna, I found her twitching on the floor with a very dark creature chomping on her body. Immediately, I was wrecked. I began to bawl. Luna had been with me for 10 years since I started my nursing career in that retirement home. My companion, my comfort, was now destroyed by whatever this weird animal was. I screamed and began to throw things at it. Anything within range. Christmas ornaments, Halloween decorations, knives, spoons, fancy holiday serving plates, and so many other things, but I didn't care to notice. I was furious, distraught. I wanted nothing more than to let it feel how I felt. I wanted to hurt it for taking away my friend, for following me from my work, for just existing a terrible, dreadful existence. The creature writhed underneath shattered glass, and it was clearly in distress, as it bent and writhed under the shards. There were bits of plastic and metal too. It gave a shriek before rushing past me onto the stairs, feverishly running away into the shadows. I couldn't let it escape, not after what it did, so I chased it until I saw it run through my door. I grabbed the door and flung it open, chasing the shadowy thing down the street, which was empty and dark, save for a few inches of snow. The world was quiet. All I could hear then was my own panting and the occasional wail from that creature. I raced after the noise down the street until I reached an all-too-familiar park. It was where I went during the weekends when I had no work and the days were warmer. Being in such a familiar place gave me a misguided sense of smugness, thinking of how well I knew this park and where I could lure the blood-covered shadow beast. I didn't know what I would do once I got a hold of it, but I knew it had to pay for what it did to Luna. I heard it crossing a few branches, making noises as it went, so I sped up, grabbing at the thing, noticing how my fingers sank into its skin. It resumed shrieking like I'd thrown it into a fire. I was filled with nothing but hatred as I began to spit on it, crying all the while as my fingers grasped and squeezed at the writhing shadow. The creature stood still, collapsing to the ground, seemingly dead. I didn't feel relieved. I didn't feel peace for avenging my furry friend. I was empty and cold. I stared down at the shadow once again, expecting to see it writhe, but I screamed instead. I was looking at Sam. My hands were wrapped around his neck, and he wasn't breathing. I screamed and cried, wondering what to do. I then rummaged through his pockets, taking out a cell phone and calling Seth. In tears, I begged him to come where I was, and I apologized over and over, and I admitted to what I did to his dad. Seth was quiet for a moment. Kathy, what's going on? Are you okay? My dad's been dead for four years. Are you on something? You can tell me. Have you taken your meds? I swallowed. I waved the phone around, shouting at it. How would I have this phone then? How would I be looking at his corpse? How would I have made it home in his red Ford? Seth replied. Kathy, my dad, had a 1966 Riviera. He hated pickup trucks. Do you need some help? No. N no, I I'm sorry. I have to go. I hung up, dropping the phone and daring to look back at the corpse. It was nothing but shadow again. I couldn't take this. I ran back home, putting Luna in a box, and I buried her near the flower bed. I couldn't stand to look at her or think about what I did to Sam. I sobbed myself to sleep, and I woke up. There was Luna, 
purring like she usually did on my lap. I hugged her, sobbing, wondering if it was some nightmare, until I looked outside. The grave I thought I'd dug was now dug up. I felt so sick, but so happy. Luna smelled fine. She smelled alive. She looked and felt alive. There she was, warm and walking and talking like my Luna, as much as cats could talk to a person. Maybe I'd lost my mind that night. Maybe the snow had sent me over the edge. Maybe hypothermia or something caused me to hallucinate. Maybe I got delirious. I don't know anymore, but I've long since moved from that town, leaving Luna with Seth. I just didn't trust her around me anymore, but I did trust him. I never again saw the shadows after that, but I can definitely say I'd rather work somewhere warmer. My uncle's time as a police officer. From Cricket Girl 20. My uncle James was a police officer for over 12 years, and he had many terrifying and horrific experiences. Three of them stand out. I will write them from his point of view. It was the early 2000s. I don't remember which year, but I do remember it was around 10 p.m., I was responding to a call of a child screaming. When I got to the address, an elderly woman was outside. She said to me, It's been quiet for a while now, but that poor child, I think his mother neglects him. But every time I call Child Protective Services, they never find any evidence. When I went in, what I saw made my stomach turn. There on the ground was a three-year-old with burns on his body, his mother was passed out drunk on the couch, and her boyfriend was on the phone in the kitchen, laughing and telling his friend that he had just burned his girlfriend's son. I told him to put his phone down. He said, when I'm done. I forcefully took the phone from his hand and slammed him to the ground, handcuffing him. I then went back to the boy. Poor thing was barely hanging on. Backup arrived, along with an ambulance. I ran out to the ambulance with the boy in my arms. At one point, he looked up at me as I sat with him in the ambulance. I then told the driver to go as fast as he could. As we were around the block from the hospital, the young boy looked at me again and smiled. But then, he went still. He stopped breathing. I cried as the ambulance arrived and the paramedics tried to revive him. When I got back to the station, I saw that the boyfriend was getting booked. I grabbed him by the neck and called him a child killer. Some other officers had to pull me off of him. Later on, the man tried to explain the situation. That the boy was crying, and he guessed he was hungry, and his mom was sleeping. The boyfriend told him to shut up repeatedly, but the boy would not. So, he picked him up, rolled him over the built-in floor heater about five times, then tossed him on the floor. The boyfriend was charged with murder, and thankfully, he didn't last long in prison. The mother was charged with child neglect. To this day, I still think about that boy. This next story is about James's first experience with a ghost as an adult. A fellow officer and I responded to a call at an old warehouse. Someone called and said that someone was in the warehouse. We got there with a canine officer and went inside. The air was cold and dense, even though it was so warm out. We announced ourselves, then began to look through the warehouse. Suddenly, the canine jerked its head toward a corner and began to bark like mad. We shined the flashlights in that direction, finding a young girl in a bloody white dress. She was staring down at the ground, whispering something. When she looked up at us, she screamed bloody murder. We both basically flew out of the building with the dog outrunning us. We got in the car and caught our breaths. Then we looked at each other. My partner said, Was that? No, it couldn't be. Did we see a ghost? I couldn't come up with another explanation. We decided to just leave the warehouse. My partner quit a few days later. 
The other officers were obviously freaked out when I told them. I tried looking up any information about that girl, maybe some disappearances, or if it was a ghost, perhaps a murder or tragedy. Truth be told, I had some nightmares for a few nights afterwards. Heck, I couldn't even watch a scary movie for a while. That girl looked like she was from the 80s, but I'll never forget the words she whispered. I told him no. I told him to stop. I said I was sorry. The canine changed after that too. That dog became aggressive towards other dogs. But as soon as the dog was retired, he went back to his old ways. I haven't seen a supposed ghost since then, but that was one of the scariest paranormal encounters I've ever had. Trust me, whenever I hear an unexplained sound, I immediately get goosebumps. This last story is not scary per se, but was heart pounding for James. I was patrolling the streets when I saw a man that we had been looking for in a grocery store parking lot. I pulled in and confronted him. I saw he had a weapon in his pants, and he began to reach for it. I pulled my sidearm and told him to get down on the ground, but he would not comply. He started to look around and spotted two elderly women walking into the store, and he said, If you don't let me go, I'll kill those two women. I had a tough choice to make. Kill this man, let him get away, or continue this stand down, risking those women's lives. I lowered my weapon, and the man ran away. I told my boss and he gave me the benefit of the doubt, but I was suspended for a week with pay. Word got to the other officers, and a lot of them began to dislike me, but I don't think I would have changed what I did. As the years progressed, the other officers became dirty, buying from dealers or using the drugs they got from drug busts. They tried getting James to go dirty too, but he wouldn't do it. After James and his wife got in a car wreck, James was fired, but he says he doesn't miss being a cop. He's enjoying his life these days. He and his wife live on the outskirts of a big city with their dog, and they enjoy going to the lake for days on end. James did apply for a job as a security guard at a local jail, but they wanted him to use a gun, so he declined. Dignitary Protection From Matto Man I've worked a number of jobs over the years, not because I haven't known what I wanted to do with my life, rather because I want to do many things with my life. Believe it or not, my time in finance had its own scary moments more than once. It's a given that my career in law enforcement had its fair share of trauma and experiences, few of which I've written about. One of the cool things of my career as a state trooper was being trained to do dignitary protection, namely for the governor, but also senators, congressmen, even dignitaries of other countries. It's a thankless job, requiring 80 to 100 hours per week, because as the secret service for the dignitary you're assigned, you'll also live in the dignitaries' homes and mansions, driving them to their meetings, even leaving the country with them. And yes, we do fly in planes with our pistols, taking them to other countries as well. You're also responsible for the first family. You end up taking the governor's wife to yoga, or the daughter to prom with her date, or even performing recon of event centers prior to the arrival of the governor, or being responsible for the exfil route and various safe houses across the state. Sometimes you drive the armored SUV well above the speed limit to avoid being bogged down in traffic, other times you carry a go bag of goodies, which may contain an MP7 and extra magazines. Needless to say, it is demanding, and you typically are only allowed to be in the position for two to three years due to the stress and the inability to see your own family. However, you typically don't apply for this job. Rather, you're hand selected by the governor himself at the suggestion of the brass of the state police it's basically impossible to say no. The training is intense, but comes in handy often in keeping my own family safe. 
and upon retirement, maintaining a business of private security for public figures, rich people, basketball players, or whomever feels the need to pay for such protection. In the instance of this story, I was not on the governor's protection unit. I started with protection of state prosecutors, working high-profile cases, which were gaining media attention. This particular individual was receiving death threats due to a controversial case. It's not my job to pay attention to headlines or know why they're in the spotlight, and it's certainly not my job to have an opinion about the individual. My job is to protect them, regardless of how I feel or how I align on these particular issues. In this case, I was tasked to protect a prosecutor who had actually taught one of the many law classes while in the academy. A prosecutor who had many crushes, and she was quite young, attractive, and very pleasant to be around. For this reason alone, protection was necessary, even if she wasn't involved in controversy. Her husband, who made a killer living in a career of his own, was not home very often, further leaving the dignitary more vulnerable. They had no children, so that actually made things a bit easier. Be there when she's home alone, and if her husband is home, I am to be on call to respond in case of emergency, and during business hours I am to drive her to meetings and the courthouse in a state-issued SUV with my trusted go bag. Simple enough, right? Well, this experience was nothing like I have experienced before in my career. Up until this moment, the only thing I've ever been afraid of is people. It was a normal fall day, October I believe. I left my personal vehicle at home and took the state vehicle to my destination, which was the dignitary's mansion in the canyon. The weather was clear that day, the type of weather where you can cruise with the windows down and not have any discomfort. This was my favorite time of year. I made my drive through the city, all the way to the house on the hills type neighborhoods. I drove even further past those homes, up into the canyon. The canyon was beautiful, the trees were already changing colors. As I drove up the canyon, the air turned more crisp, as the trees changed to pines and firs, making it clear I'd gained significant elevation. It was an enjoyable drive, winding around the canyon hairpin turns, enjoying every minute of the drive. I eventually arrived at the residence. It was an imposing mansion overlooking much of the canyon. The city sat a couple of miles below. It was truly a sight to behold. I could tell the home was built years ago, still very nice and luxurious, but definitely not new. The type of home you'd expect a murder mystery themed play or movie to be centered in. I pulled up to a wrought iron gate, scanned my badge, and it opened automatically. I drove up a winding driveway to a four-car garage and a guest house surrounded by a courtyard, which was tastefully decorated with a pretend cemetery for Halloween. I was greeted at my vehicle by the other dignitary agent, who was going to be briefing me for my first day. It was clear he was anxious to leave and enjoy his coming days off, so he was talking and walking quickly. He gave me the lay of the land. The property was expansive and entirely off the grid and self-reliant. It had its own solar power, generating its own electricity efficiently enough that it wasn't wired to any municipal electric company. The house had several very large propane tanks, which were filled by a private company, also ensuring the property was not connected to the city's grid. All the water came from its own well and a natural spring. All of it was quite impressive. Toward the end of the property, elevation starts to gain as it lies directly against the mountain. The entire property was protected with a nine-foot fence, motion sensor lights, infrared lights, motion detectors, and even a safe room. You know, things people with money seem to have. I saw evidence of wildlife on the expansive property, and I swear I saw some mountain lion tracks too. The agent took me inside, showing me around the mansion. He took me to the panic room, showing me the CCTV screens, how the motion sensors worked, things like that. He then took me to the gym, indoor pool, and basketball court. Yeah, I meant it when I said it was expansive, honestly surprising these people would even leave their home. 
The place was full of corridors, libraries, and drafty doors and windows. Not all of the house had been updated. He also informed me of the dignitary's preference for contact, more or less saying, She's very friendly, but she's not your friend, so never start conversations unless she initiates, and never crowd her in a room. You gotta find a happy medium of watching over her and the property without her seeing you too much, and absolutely never be at the pool when she's there. She will fire you if she thinks you're eyeballing her in her bathing suit. Pretty understandable stuff. More or less, she was not thrilled with needing security, and was looking forward to the day when we were not needed any longer. I took mental notes, and I tried to retain all of it, but before long he was rushing out the door, ready to have his own life for a couple of days. It was beginning to get dark, so I made some rounds around the property, making sure the exterior doors were locked, the lights were on, and looking for anything unusual. I ran into the dignitary in the courtyard on the phone. I could tell she would have preferred to ignore me, but being friendly, she waved and smiled. I continued on my way, trying to look busy. I walked to the guest house. The guest house may even be older than the mansion itself. If I had to guess, it was probably here as the original home on the property. It was all imposing red brick, probably about 1,200 square feet in total. It was maintained well despite its age. It was clear the interior was less of a priority and was mostly made up for security purposes. It was nice, but not overly luxurious. I entered the front door, which was a large and heavy double door made of solid wood, which let out this ominous squeal when I slowly opened it. The house smelled like old wood and ancient history. You know the smell. The outlets looked like what I imagine the first ever electrical outlets ever designed probably looked like, and I barely trusted them enough to plug my phone in. I found the kitchen, which was well stocked and somewhat updated. The bedroom looked like it contained original furniture from whatever pioneer built the home, but the second bedroom was much different. It contained CCTV camera monitors and motion sensor alarms access to a panel to control the gate and exterior doors of the home. It was clear they dropped some cash to somehow make that portion of the building capable of withstanding that load, as it had a lot of equipment. The only furniture piece that seemed new was a TV installed in the bedroom and a speaker system that was wired through the whole home, clearly for alarms. It felt pretty vulnerable, being far away from the dignitary. Surely she had rooms I could stay in in the actual mansion. Probably actually luxurious rooms. But she put us out here in the guest house for a reason. She wanted to feel normal in life. I ate a quick dinner and hit the sack, slightly anxious of danger like I usually was at work. I was startled awake. I forgot where I was at the moment. I grabbed at my MP7 which I'd stowed in my go bag before I realized I was awakened by emotion alarm in the courtyard outside. I checked the cameras and I saw no movement. I wondered if false alarms were common. It was only about 2 a.m. I sat at the cameras for a few moments to see if there was more movement, but there was nothing. I went back to sleep. I woke up early to make more rounds around the property and I found nothing of concern. I saw the dignitary outside on the brisk morning, wearing a skimpy workout outfit. I certainly was not going to approach her. She, however, was friendly and approached me instead, asking how I slept and if I needed anything. She even offered me breakfast, which I refused. I informed her I'd found nothing of concern, and that I'd be here for a few days before my shift ended. I told her my name and asked her to reach out if she had any concerns herself. She was eager to ask how I felt about the guest house, to which I lied and said it was swanky. In reality, I missed my own bed and not ancient home. The conversation was over and I went on with my business. Later that day, I escorted her to the courthouse with no worrisome events to report. That evening, I did my routine and hit the sack again awakened once more by an alarm at 2am 
to movement outside in the courtyard. There was nothing on the cameras. As I sat at the monitors for a moment, another motion alarm went off, this time for the small porch of the guest home. My blood was chilled as I heard a small knock at the front door. The cameras still showed nothing, simply the wind whipping up debris that had to be what was causing the motion sensor to trigger, maybe even the knock on the door. A plausible explanation. I sat for a few moments before going to bed, this time making sure the MP7 was ready to do its job, just in case. The next day came and went with no incident that I can recall. However, the dignitary did follow up to ask how my night was. I reported, Nothing unusual whatsoever, ma'am. She was eager to ask once again. The conversation ended, and I thought nothing more of it. The third night here is when things changed forever for me. Like routine, 2 a.m., the alarm goes off. But there's nothing on the cameras. The alarm goes off on the porch as well, and a knock on the door is heard once again. I'm having a much harder time rationalizing it this time. I decided I had to go outside to investigate, MP7 in hand to fend off an intruder or threat to the dignitary. I exited the guest home and I entered the courtyard. I walked through the pretend cemetery and approached my vehicle, deciding to walk around the vehicle and down the driveway to check the front gate. When I got there, the gate was sealed shut. There was no evidence of recent entry. I walked back to my car, unlocking the door, and sat in it with the lights off to see if any sort of movement happened while I was hidden inside. I did fall asleep briefly. I woke up after a few minutes, feeling dumb that I, a professional, could sleep through a potential threat. I opened my car door and got out, with the door open, I decided to stretch, trying to wake myself up again. I then felt something. A presence, like there was someone right behind me. I felt a chill in the air, chillier than a normal October evening. I turned. There, standing directly behind me, was a small girl with red hair and an old-timey dress, she had a visible injury to her face and head. I stumbled back, flight instinct taking over. I fell on my back like a coward. Just as quickly as she came, she was gone. I lay there gun in hand, wondering if I'd just reached the brink of sanity, or if that was indeed real. I came to my senses eventually, and promptly ran back to my now much creepier guest home where I turned on all the lights and refused to sleep. By morning, I realized I needed to make the rounds again, make my presence known to the dignitary. She was once more outside in her workout attire, definitely not covering enough to keep her warm, considering there was frost on the ground. She eagerly approached me, asking how my night was. She then noticed the bags under my eyes, then she asked me something that bothered me deeply. You finally saw her, didn't you? I nodded yes, expecting her to fire me for being insane or something. She said, follow me, and took me inside to the library in the home, a musty old room with dark wood, black walls, and old furniture. She found an old book dated from the late 1800s. She explained that this was a government record of the ownership of this plot of land. She continued on, saying it was settled by Irish immigrants, who eventually became quite wealthy. Their daughter died on the property due to some farming accident. She said that the whole darned family keeps us up some nights, and left it at that. She did admit she loved the home nevertheless, even loved the ghosts. She said the activity increased when they renovated the mansion, adding the pool and other amenities. 
She explained that all of the security forces saw her, and that I should not be alarmed. But, honestly, this did not help me feel any better. I texted the prior agent, the one who had onboarded me, and told him about the experience. He replied, saying, You'd have to be crazy to think I'd lead with a story like that. You would never have let me leave the darned property if I did. I mean, yeah, he had a point. I proceeded to work my assignments there until I was eventually transferred to an investigation unit, which held its own set of traumas for me that I'll have to tell you about another time. Thanks for tuning in to Tales from the Break Room, the home of the scariest true work stories. If you want to hear your story narrated by me, send it to me at eeriecast.com slash submit. We pay five cents per word for accepted stories. Help us grow by leaving Tales from the Break Room a rating and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast app. Check out eeriecast.com or search for EerieCast on those very same podcast apps to see our other exciting and terrifying podcasts, like Unexplained Encounters, the other show I host, where I read stories with a focus on the supernatural. To get some merch, go to eeriecast.store. And to unlock ad-free episodes of your favorite EerieCast shows and exclusive audiobooks, go to eeriecast.com plus and consider signing up for EerieCast+. Plus. You can follow me on Twitter, I guess it's X now, at Dark Prevails. You can also subscribe to me on YouTube, where I deliver the same content. Just look for Darkness Prevails. Good night. I hope we can share another break sometime soon.